In this video, we're going to review thermodynamics. Remember that the prefix thermo refers to heat, and so this is all about the movement and usage of heat. We started off by modeling matter, and we call that the kinetic model. Remember, we were only really concerned about gases, and in a gas, particles are perfectly hard spheres, which don't interact, and essentially move at random. There's lots of space in between them, so they're running into each other and exchanging energy. They bounce off of each other, and so they're elastic, meaning energy is conserved. Um, and we refer to the kinetic energy of these atoms, molecules, whatever, as heat. So again, heat's a form of kinetic energy because it's just the motion of whatever makes something up. We define the term pressure as force over area. Remember that gases exert pressure due to collisions with the walls of their container. So the air in a balloon exerts pressure simply because the air is running into the walls of the balloon. There's three ways we could change the pressure of a system. One is to reduce the volume, like squeezing a balloon. The pressure gets too high and the balloon pops because you squeeze it. What you're doing is increasing the pressure while you reduce the volume. The second is to add more gas. This is what happens when you inflate your tires, pump more air into there, the pressure goes up. And then the third way is to add heat. Think about exploding a baked potato in your microwave. The heat that you add to the baked potato increases the pressure and eventually it causes the skin of the potato to rupture. We can use pressure, which again is a force term, to do work. So if we can make something expand, then it can push something and make it move, and that's how we turn heat back into useful work. The term temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules. Key term is average, so a big thing and a small thing can have the same temperature because on average their molecules have the same amount of energy. There's three temperature scales we need to know. The first is the Fahrenheit scale. It's defined as water freezing at 32 degrees and boiling at 212 degrees. The Celsius scale, which is what we typically use in science, water freezes at 0 degrees and boils at 100 degrees Celsius. The Kelvin scale was designed to be an absolute temperature scale, meaning you can never have a negative temperature. So zero Kelvin is absolute zero, which is the lowest possible theoretical temperature you could ever have. You have to use the Kelvin scale when you're using gas laws, like the PV equals NRT thing that you learned in chemistry. Remember that heat and temperature are related to each other, but they're not the same thing. When you add heat to something, you could change its temperature, but they're not the same thing. Heat's a measure of energy, which would be measured in joules. Temperature is a measure of average energy, and we use those three scales to measure it. What we would really like to do is to use heat in order to do work. We can turn heat into mechanical work when a gas expands and pushes on something. So, as a real simple example, and we drew this during our thermal unit, Suppose that we have a sample of gas whose temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. We light a fire underneath it, and we add a thousand joules of heat. If there's no movement, then the temperature is going to rise because the gas gains 1,000 joules of energy. Now that's typical, that's common, that's every day, that's boring. That doesn't do any work for us. Okay? So no work is done because there's no movement. So what we want to do is we want to make something like this move and do work. So what we're going to do is we're going to make the same kind of system, but we're going to top it with a piston which is free to move. We can attach this piston to other things like the wheels of a car, for example. So when we put our sample of gas in there, again let's say it has an initial temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, and we add fire underneath it, so we add a thousand joules of heat. Because the pressure increases, that piston is going to go up. The piston is going to rise some distance d, because the gas inside is pushing on it harder. 
So that increased pressure is going to cause the piston to go up. Because there's a force, because there's a displacement, the piston has done work. So the expanding gas has done work in making that piston rise. The final temperature would no longer be 100 degrees, but rather it would be 80 degrees Celsius. Again, this is just an example. The reason it doesn't get as hot is because the gas only gains 800 joules of energy. If it gains 800 joules of energy, that means it gets hot but not as hot. That also means that 200 joules had to go into doing work. So if you multiply the force by the distance, you would get 200 joules. And so we would get 200 joules of work out of this particular um, example. You would refer to such a thing as a heat engine. Now something to remember is that 800 joules of leftover heat is wasted energy. We can't really get that into doing useful work. It has to be exhausted some sort of way. So for example, in your car engine, you have to have that tailpipe so that the leftover heat from the engine can be exhausted out the back. Heat's transferred between two objects whenever they have different temperatures and heat will be transferred between them until they reach equilibrium in which case they have the same temperature. So remember same temperature means that they're in thermal equilibrium with each other. So heat's always transferred from a hot object to a cold object. So to kind of draw a simple picture, I suppose you have two objects, one is which is at 200 degrees Celsius, the other which is at zero degrees Celsius. Heat's going to flow from the hot object to the cold object until they reach the same temperature, which may be 140 degrees Celsius. It's not necessarily going to be exactly in between the two starting temperatures because that's going to depend on what the mass of both objects are and what they're made out of. So again, when they reach equilibrium, the net heat transfer between them is zero. There's three methods of heat transfer that we can use or that occur in nature. The first is conduction. This is just the direct contract, direct transfer of heat through be between two objects that are in direct contact with each other. In order for conduction to occur, the objects have to be touching each other. So for example, you put bacon in a skillet. The bacon is, is um, touching the skillet, and so it's heating via conduction. The second method of heat transfer is radiation. Radiation, excuse me, convection. Um, convection occurs when a fluid, remember fluids are liquids and gases, go up because they're hotter. When they're hotter, they're less dense. So in general, convection is the movement of fluids based on their temperature differences. Hot fluids goes up, in other words. So in another example would be roasting a chicken over an open fire. Fire goes up, that's a good example of convection. Our third method is radiation. That's the transfer through waves, namely electromagnetic waves such as light, microwaves, examples like that. Um, so a good example will be heating onion rings under a heat lamp. The heat lamp glows and that light is what's used to heat up the onion rings. To figure out the amount of heat transferred, we use the equation that we learned that relates these three things. First is the mass, the second is the temperature change, or delta T, and then the third is what the object is made out of. We measure that with the term specific heat, remember that has the, term, or the um, symbol capital C. And so the amount of heat transfer we give the symbol Q, and we get the equation Q equals MC delta T. Some trends to remember, metals in general have low specific heats, that's why I make pots and pans out of them. We want the heat to be transferred to what we're cooking. Water has a very high specific heat. That's why the radiator in your car is filled with water. It takes a lot of energy to heat water up, so water is capable of absorbing a lot of heat without really changing its temperature a whole lot. 
This is the end of our thermodynamics review. As always, if you have questions, please let me know.